Dave, you're one of the busiest trumpet players in LA. So how do you get gigs? Well, uh, it's nice of you to say. I I don't uh, I don't necessarily always feel that way. I mean, I feel uh -huh. busy, but it's uh, you know, uh, I'm just happy every month that that I can put it all together. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, getting gigs is something that you know a lot of a lot of my students ask, a lot of my uh, younger colleagues ask, and so I actually have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, you know, there's there's not like one thing that's going to really do it for you. It's a combination of things. Um, and I think if I were to think about like a big picture term, uh, I would think about positivity, actually, and spreading positivity and being uh, being positive about what you're doing and enjoying what you're doing. If you don't enjoy this, please, please, I'm begging you do something else, because this is a very hard way to make a living, you know, getting gigs. And, uh, you know, there are often times when I'll look at the calendar and there's very little on it, you know, and somehow miraculously those dates fill up. But I don't I don't always know that until maybe the week of or sometimes the day of uh, that's happened to me. Um, but like I said, uh, I, I try to just keep a positive spin on things. Uh, it's a lot more fun that way. It, it's really easy to like feed into your negativity like, oh, man, this gig, this gig is a drag. I, I'm not enjoying this. Uh, you know, I don't like playing with this person, w whatever. But it's like, just don't even don't even give that any power. You know, try and think about like, man, I'm, I'm so lucky to, to be doing what I'm doing. I enjoy playing for a living. Um, all of that stuff is really important. So, so again, like just keeping a positive spin on what you're doing and being positive to be around. Uh, people will like you more if you're more likable. <laughs> if you're a drag, people don't want to be around you. So be nice 100% of the time. Be nice to people. Um, if you find that like doing a particular job is going to make you negative, if you find that doing a particular job is going to, you know, if you're just going to hate it, then like give yourself a raise. Say no. Like you don't have to be there. Um, and I made that mistake probably about a year and a half ago. I said yes to a job that like I knew wasn't going to be, wasn't going to make me happy. <laughs> and I was a drag on the job. And I, I thought, man, shame on me. Like that's, that's, that's on me. That's not on the person that offered me the work. It's like, if you don't want the work, don't take the work. So put yourself in positions to succeed. Um, you know, when you're new in town, you got to say yes to everything, of course, but like, once you've got a lot going on, uh, you know, be selective when you can. And and again, like that was just a situation where like I said yes and I shouldn't have. And at the end of the day, I blamed myself for my bad attitude. And and if I could go back, I I would have a better attitude on that job. Um, I mean, I don't think I was that unpleasant, but like inside, I was really unhappy. You know, so um, amazing. So that's just like a, a little thing about that. I, I'd also say like it goes without saying you have to work hard. Like you have to practice, you know, think of uh, the practice room as work. Like you need to punch the clock every day for work. And if you're not doing that and then you're not working, then you need to look in the mirror and have a serious conversation with yourself. Um, you also need to identify in your practice time, your strengths and your liabilities. You know, if there are things you're really good at, you know, those are the kinds of things that you want to kind of highlight in your performances. Uh, and if you have some liabilities, like, you need to be spending time on those in the practice room. Then like, that's it. And most importantly, get help. Like there are some wonderful people around you that are willing to help you. Um, oftentimes, sometimes like you'll get help from somebody that you didn't even realize was so helpful in that area, you know, but talk to people, play for people, all of that stuff. Um, make friends is probably like the biggest thing. Uh, I consider my business a business of friends, which is great. You know, I get to see my friends at work every single day, except for today. I don't know where I'm going. I'm doing a gig. I don't know who's on it, uh -huh. <laughs> but, I, but I'm planning on making a new friend at that job, you know, because I like having friends. I, I like liking people, you know, so that's, that's a, a, a nice way to do business, I think. So do you think um, do you think people can tell, you know, like if you show up to a gig and inside you don't want to be there, but you put on the smile, do people do you think people can tell that you're faking it and it's still a negative drag on, you know, it's still negative energy, even though you kind of outwardly look happy? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Um I I do my best to to stay cool, 
even if I'm like fuming. Because uh, again, I just I don't want to be I don't want to be a drag. You know, I, I don't want to make somebody's day harder. Um, I mean, I, and I'm sure I have made somebody's day harder, like, but I don't want to do that, you know, so, so I really try and, you know, rein it in. Uh, but every now and then, I mean, we're all human, and it gets the better of us. Uh, so, so you really just want to look like you're enjoying yourself, have a smile when you walk in, have good or, energy. Yeah, I try to have good energy. And then if I don't have good energy, I, you know, I try and remember that, like, if you don't have something nice to say, you know, don't say anything. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the other one that, you know, I need to remind myself of this quote every day that the Mark Twain, uh, tis better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, don't talk so, too much. Yeah, so you it's know. like, you know, say just enough. Um, I mean, it's funny, there are a couple of couple of players I can think of that have rubbed people the wrong way because they didn't say enough. It's like, well, what's his problem? I felt like he was vibing me when really it's like, that's just a quiet person. <laughs> Yeah. And they're trying not to say too much because they don't want to say the wrong thing. So there is a balance there, too. It's, you know, I try to be sociable. I also try and find things that, like, we can all agree on, you know. So even if it's somebody that, like, is rubbing me the wrong way, I'll try and find some way where, like, maybe I can still enjoy their company, you know, because maybe mm -hmm. there's something we both like, you know, maybe we're both car people, for example, you know, so it's like, or maybe we both like a good ribeye steak. Uh, you know, mm. there's a, there's always something where you can enjoy the person person you're with, and I and I like to do that from a genuine perspective. Like I don't I don't like to I can't fake it. You know, so so I really do try and find things that like we can genuinely agree on and and genuinely have a good time together because that's that's way more fun. And does it come down to gratitude too? Like you kind of have to just be grateful for what you have rather than being like, you know, resisting it if it's a crappy gig. Like be oh. grateful for the gig and you'll get more of it in a way. Like, yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean like for, you know, and I don't know who's going to watch this, but I mean, if we can all look back to say 2020, you know, when there was no work, like you would have killed for a gig that you hate. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I always kind of remember that too. It's like, well, I could be practicing at home with no gigs in the future. You know, but instead I'm here getting paid to play. So it's not that bad. So like if you hate the crappy gigs, then you'll get you'll start to get the good gigs in a way. I mean, like Yeah, I suppose. You know, yeah. I, I mean uh, if you I mean, excuse me, if you like the crappy gigs, you'll start to get the good gigs. Yeah. Yeah, and like uh, you never know who you're gonna meet on those gigs. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean I I can't even remember how many times like I'll do just a rando job with somebody and it was a whatever job, like I neither liked it or disliked it and whatever. And then all of a sudden I get called three years later to teach at a college because I met this person there or, or, Hey, like I, I remember working with you, like I'm doing this musical, are you available or, you know, stuff like that. I mean, you just never know. It's, it's crazy how that mm -hmm. works. Um, you know, the other thing that's, that's like really helpful, uh, and I mean, it's not as helpful anymore, but I still like to carry them with me is like to have a physical business card. Uh, because like when somebody has something in their hands, uh, I think that's a lot more memorable than something that's like, oh, let me just airdrop you my contact. Um, so, you know, I'd recommend, especially to like new people to, to do that, like have a card and have it be on quality stock. That's um, awesome. Yeah. yeah. So that um, and uh, so be cool, be nice, be a joy to be around and play well, right? Yes, be be undeniable with your ability mm -hmm. you now. And and if you're still deniable with your ability, like I said, try to identify your strengths and highlight those. Um, and of course, I said, like, be nice all the time and, and, and do it in a genuine way. I mean, I hate it when people come up to me and I can tell they're just talking to me because they feel obligated to for business, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but then there are other people that come up to me and talk to me because like, you know, hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. Like what's new? And, uh, you know, I like that. Um, and I like doing that. I, I'm really not good at like playing the game. Uh, I, I hate playing the game as a matter of fact. So don't even think um, of it as a game. Just think about it as making friends, be cool. Yeah, try to just be a decent person, mm -hmm. you know, um, who enjoys what they do. And then I think, other people that enjoy what they do that are decent people will will join you.
What do you think like when when you're around people on gigs and they're playing, what do you think is the number one thing or the or the first couple things that you could think of like, oh, this person's not so great at this particular skill, like we don't have want to have him back. Like what are the top skills that you really need to be good at to be good in these type of situations? Man, that's a great question. Um mm -hmm. and I and I hope there are, you know, I, I hope this goes over the right way with whoever watches this, but you know, for me, um, know your role. I think is is really important. You know, if you're playing second trumpet and I'm playing principal, then like, I need you to help me sound good, right? Um, if you're playing principal and I'm playing second, you know, you need to lead the way so that I can make you sound good. Um, so that's important, like knowing your role, knowing how you fit into the to the ensemble, to the overall musical texture. Um, play in tune, you know. Uh, Huge. Play in tune. Play in tune with yourself. Play in tune with the groove. You know, um, you know, that's a big one for me. Uh, but like, I, I think those two kind of paired together, you know, know your role and be in tune. And of course, play musically, um, which of course will depend on the on the situation and, and how that works. But uh, but those two things are are really, really big for me. Yeah, I'm glad you said play in tune because, yeah, for me, that's like the one of the number one things. That's what people always talk about. You know, why don't we want this person back? It's because they can't play in tune. It's almost it almost always comes to that down to that first, yeah. you know, than the other things. But yeah, and also like and also to like be be like aware of like what the other players around you are doing, you know, so it's like if you're playing bum, ba ba, and everybody else is playing ba ba da, you know, don't don't stand your ground get with everybody <laughs> like listen yeah. yeah listen don't don't think that like you're high and mighty over everybody else because like maybe this band or orchestra or whatever plays it this way even though it's written a certain way that you think is right you know and just because your tuner says you're in tune you may not be in tune with the group um so you know be malleable i think is important you know exactly and, and uh and uh sensitive how do you improve your intonation? Like, say you have bad intonation. How do you want? How do you get good at it? Uh, that's a great question. I, I mean, I'd say get lessons for, <laughs> for mm -hmm. starters. But, but you know, spend some time with a tuner. You know, as dull as it is, uh, play long tones, play scales, play exercises, and just try and see like where the needle's going as you're playing. You know, so that way, like, you'll start to get a sense of like, okay, every time I play an A, it's it's sharp, and and maybe I can play alternative fingerings or or move a slide or maybe bend the pitch, you know, um, singing, buzzing, whistling, all of that stuff. You know, just just working on uh, uh, matching and identifying like where your issues are. Yeah, and um, you know. The fact that you're so busy, how do you work practice in? I mean, do you have like a routine that you do, like things that you need to cover every day so you can stay Dave? You know, like what are certain things that you do and how do you work that into your day? Yeah, um, that's, you know, that's the million dollar question, really. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's a struggle. And, uh, you know, I, I I was telling a student the other day, you know, I was remembering, you know, the line in, in Spaceballs, you know, where where he loses his Schwartz ring and, and Yoda says, Oh, it's, it's been within you the whole time, mm -hmm. you know? So at times when, <laughs> at times when I, I feel like I'm not able to do as much of my routine and, and like, I guess, uh, uh, organize practice the way that I like to, I try and remember that the Schwartz is within me that I have to, uh, you know, I've done all of this stuff so many times I need to draw upon those experiences and get myself mentally back there. Um, and actually, like, and I, I talk about uh, your 30 minute uh, practice routine, which is, you know, amazing. Uh, and so I've tried to kind of like pare down what I'm doing, you know, to get because uh, if those of you haven't seen Nick's, you know, 30 minute practice uh, routine is amazing. And there's one quote like, uh, what is it? 80 percent of the progress comes from 20 percent of the work, mm -hmm. you know. And so I try and think about that and how I can really get that 20 percent progress happening in a hundred percent of the time. So, mm -hmm. um, so I do have, you know, I do have a, a routine that I do. It's mainly, it's not so much about like, um, nuts and bolts per se. It's more about like establishing a good air column, uh, and a good tongue position. Cause if I can have both of those going, then everything else will come a lot easier. So, 
so what I do daily, and it doesn't take that long, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes of just kind of, you know, simple exercises. It's all influenced by the teachers I've had, you know, Vince DiMartino showed me a wonderful lead, lead pipe and uh, airflow exercises. And I do a lot of Vince's stuff. Um, I studied with Jens Lindemann and he has a great like Chikowitz based, um, you know, kind of routine. Uh, I did a lot of stamp and bending exercises with John Lewis. And so I still incorporate those. Um, Ray Sasaki showed me some airflow and technical studies and, uh, and one of my first teachers, Bernie Nero, had me do a lot of Clark uh, Clark studies. And I know for you non-trumpet players, that won't mean much, but the, but I, I try to kind of incorporate all of those things every day if I can. So it's just kind of reminding your body what it needs to do every day, like you just keeping yourself refreshed, because if you're not working on it, you're getting worse, you know? So it's like you have yeah. to constantly moving, be moving forward. Yeah, and I think like, you know, I think playing the trumpet you know, can be so challenging just because we're dealing with such a small amount of tissue that, you know, it is really important to get that basic fundamental of sound and, and response happening. So I find if, if that's not happening, then it really doesn't matter what else I do, you know, because if I'm playing scales with bad response, then I'm not really even, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not doing anybody any good. Like, do you have a certain time of a day that of the day that you normally do that or you just kind of try to work it in when you can or is there do you have like a routine like a normal time that you practice that you can do that every day or is it to change every day it changes every day i mean mm -hmm. i find the hardest is actually when i'm home on a day that i'm off <laughs> mm -hmm. you know because like because there's everything that i have to catch up on just being a person and also having two kids you know so i'm catching up on all the home stuff and all of a sudden it's 11 o'clock at night and I haven't played trumpet yet. So sometimes it's 11 o'clock at night. Sometimes it's closer to midnight. Um, luckily my neighbors are super cool. Thank you neighbors. Mm -hmm. You know, but, uh, but I do a lot of late night practice and I hate it, but, but it's like I said, I punch the clock, you know, and if, yeah. I, if, I, if I don't punch the clock and then I start not getting called for stuff, you know, like I said, you know, it's, cause yeah, no, cause a lot of times, um, you don't, you don't notice yourself getting worse necessarily. Like, you know, say you don't practice a few days, you won't notice it first, but I think other people will notice it before you in a way. I don't know if you've seen that before in your career, but it's well, like... <laughs> well, as, as brass players, especially trumpet players, we have a saying, like, if I miss one day, I notice if I miss two days, my wife notices, uh -huh. if I miss three days, the audience notices. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, but, so for yeah, me, I, yeah. yeah. For, for me, it's like one day and I'm like, I'm like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get back at it. You know. Yeah, like that's what I tell people too. Like one day is an event, two days is a pattern. Like if you're taking two days off, that's who you are now. You know, yeah. you take one day off, that's just something that happened. Yeah. So yeah, it's just uh, don't miss twice. You know. Totally, man. Yeah. I, I I agree. I mean, sometimes we get hurt, you know, and so so then you know, in the event of an injury, then yeah, like a day or two, like yeah, you got to do that just to be better. But otherwise, like no get back in there and, and get the horn on your face. Mm -hmm. Do you ever do that when you're on the road? Because you're all over the place. I mean, you're driving north, south. Do you ever try to sneak in practice? Like when you get to a gig or get to like a place that you're teaching or something? Yeah. You know, if I can do, you know, if I can get in into my room where I'm teaching a little bit early, I'll, I'll get the horn out and, and, and play a little bit. Um, if I have a big performance coming up, sometimes I'll get someplace early and just practice in my car. Um, you know, or sometimes I'll put in the practice mute and just, you know, wherever I am, just try to get a little bit in, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's different. Like when I was, when I was a kid, you know, junior high or, or middle school and high school, you know, I just wanted to play the trumpet all the time. So any free, free second I had, I, I, I was playing the trumpet just cause it was fun, you know? And I was, I was remembering that the other day and I thought like, you know, I'm still actually that same kid. It's just, I have all this other stuff to do. Um, you know, but I'd like to get back ultimately to like being that kid where it's like, I got, where's my horn? I gotta, I gotta go practice. Um, it's just, you know, life gets in the way sometimes. Uh, so we have to be a little bit more methodical about how we do it. Um, and like uh, Jens Lindemann talked about like living here. So sometimes whatever you're working on, work on these two measures and only do these two measures, you know, uh, instead of it being all over the place. Uh, but he said like all of this other stuff, you know how to play just work here you mm -hmm. know, and identifying those, those little, little areas to work on. And that's kind of fun. So uh, I, I'm trying to do that. I, I've got some new things cooking this, 
this year and uh, it's making my practice a little more challenging. So I'm, I, I am trying to like maintain uh, enthusiasm for that uh, and, and get, you know, just find ways to sneak it in like that. Cause it is fun. Like I still love playing. Yeah. And you got to kind of steal like 20 minutes here and there. That's what I tell people too. like steal 20 minutes, steal 50 minutes. Sometimes it can be spread out. Right. I mean, totally. have to be all together. And yeah, but I think uh, like you were saying, as you age, it becomes less inspiration based and more, you know, punching the clock, right? You got to think of it like in terms of just the consistency because uh, the inspiration comes and goes. But um, if you if you punch the clock every day, you'll be there. Right. So. Oh, yeah. You're going to lose your inspiration. Mm -hmm. It just happens. You'll get it back, but you'll lose it and you'll get it back. <laughs> so, you know, every time you lose it, you just have to remember, like, I still have to go to work. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to ask you about your sound, because when I hear you play, you sound like three trumpets. You know, I mean, you sound your your sound is huge. So how do you get that? And how did you get that? Well, that's really nice of you to say, Nick. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't uh, I don't always feel that way, <laughs> it's, you know, as I'm doing it. But um, but like my tone has always been kind of, you know, it's 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 been within me. Like I, I picked up. I picked up a cornet in, in sixth grade and I sounded exactly the same as I do now, really, because mm -hmm. it was it was just kind of a natural occurrence for me. Um, it was like I played it and I just knew what I wanted it to be like. And it, and it was just there, you know, so I think I got kind of lucky. Um, of course, like my ears have changed over the years. My equipment has changed over the years. Uh, my tastes have changed over the years, but the the basic tone hasn't changed. Um, I just I really try and focus on having a good core to the sound, um, and I want the trumpet to be rich and brilliant at the same time. You know, uh, there has to be enough kind of high frequency in the sound so that it will carry, but I also want it to have like enough depth and core so that it's felt kind of as a beautiful instrument and not as like a you know yeah. a punchy thing. You know, uh, some players are have a natural gift for brightness uh in their sound that has never been me you know so i've i've had to kind of work to attain more brightness out of my sound um but it, you know it, it's it's something that continues to evolve and i i just i try to have a tone imagination every day like to know like what i want it to sound like and uh and i'm taking my best guess because i can't really hear me i'm on the wrong side of the bell mm -hmm. so and yeah. really all of us i mean you know uh you know i wish you could hear you play bassoon uh you know because i'm sure what it sounds as you're playing is very different than what i'm hearing you know i mean it's glorious where i'm sitting so i i hope it's glorious where you're sitting <laughs> yeah i mean so when you first started you had the sound that you wanted in your head before you even picked up the trumpet it's like i this is what you know you want it to sound like so yeah. it just came, then it just came out because your body produced it, right? Yeah, but that mm -hmm. can sometimes, you know, that's sometimes been a, a problem. You know, if I play a particular trumpet or mouthpiece that, you know, I think is gonna be great, but it wasn't really designed to sound how I wanna sound. And then my body will fight that, that equipment to produce what's in my head. And then I end up like hurting myself without realizing it. So it's, it's a weird thing. Like I, I know other players that they just always sound great and it doesn't seem to matter what they play, but I need all the help I can get. You know, I just, I, I have to be dialed in. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people don't really realize that what happens outside the instrument is an, is an extension of what's going on inside your head. Right. Absolutely. So how do you build that, those sounds in your head? How do you build a tonal imagination? Like you were talking about? Uh, yeah, good very good question i think like listen as much as you can uh record yourself as much as you can you know try and get a decent recording setup which is pretty easy to do now um and 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 just practice recording anything like etudes scales solo works whatever or take it to a gig um you know or a rehearsal and, and record yourself out in the hall just so you can hear like what's being perceived versus what you're hearing um and uh and yeah like i said listen to lots of recordings you know find find sounds that you love and uh and it, and what's even better is like if you can find some colleagues and friends that you really respect you know and try to be around them and absorb that energy really you know and you'll start doing what they do which is really cool 
Was there one trumpet player that you really wanted to sound like, or was it kind of like a combination of different people that you kind of wanted this aspect from this person, this aspect from that person? Yeah, it, it, that's kind of a constantly evolving thing, you mm -hmm. know. But uh, you know, I I try to always be like somewhat obsessed with whoever I'm taking lessons with, you know, just so that like I can really dig into like what they're saying, um, you know. So if I really love their playing, then I can get a lot more from them. Um, and of course, like, you know, you're, you're never going to love everything somebody does, but, um, but I mean, uh, if you can find somebody that you respect that much, it, it's, it's really helpful. So that's a, that's an important thing too, right? Like study with the people that you want to sound like, do you think yeah. that's really important? So, yeah, because I think a lot of people that go study with teachers just because they happen to teach at this certain place or this certain school or because it's a certain institution or whatever, but it's really important to kind of like move into the place where and study with the person that you want to be like, right? Yeah. And, and to have an open mind, you know, uh, I mean, there were a couple of, a couple of teachers I studied with where like, I didn't have an open mind when I started with them and, you know, oh, I could have learned so much more and I, I, I will forever hate myself for that. I've been there. Yeah. And really, and really everybody has something to teach you. So even if you don't like they're playing at all, they're, they're, they are still good at something that you're not and pay attention. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, when you're teaching students, what do you tell them to do first? I mean, do you set them on a routine? Do you kind of look at their weaknesses and what they need? Or do you kind of have, a, have a, like a set routine that you give students just to get them going and cover the fundamentals and whatnot? Yeah, I, you know, I got a really a huge shout out to uh, uh, my boss at uh, uh, RCC, Kevin Mays. Uh, he, he really did a great job in putting together like a set of exercise, uh, exercises for the, every trumpet student there to work on, regardless of who they study with. Um, and so that's been, that was a really big influence on my teaching actually. Um, and even though like at the other schools I teach, I may do a slightly different, different routine, but I do try and like put together a set of exercises that like all my students can do. So that way it, you know, there are certain kind of fundamentals and certain benchmarks that they're all going to meet. Um, but of course, every student's different. So it, it's, you know, some of those exercises are going to be very easy. And then some of them are going to be very difficult. Um, but, but it's really, I, I like to have that kind of kind of set up so that way they can succeed on a very basic level. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And I just want to ask you about performing live. Um, you know, how do you feel on stage? Are you generally comfortable on stage or? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm generally very comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. as long as everything's going well, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, if, if, uh, if my fundamentals are in place and I'm feeling good about playing the trumpet, then I got no worries for the most mm -hmm. part, you know, every now and then there'll be a, a piece of music that that's going to make me sweat. But, um, but like I've done enough live performances now, you know, that it's, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty cool customer. Uh, but, you know, like I said, every now and then uh, I have an off day and, and I'm like, man, I don't know what note's going to come out right now. I'm terrified. So uh, so that's where, again, like really focusing on the fundamentals and being comfortable on the trumpet uh, comes into play. Because if I'm comfortable there, then like there's there's very little out here that's going to make me make me nervous. Do you have any strategies for that? I mean, are there things that you use, like, you know, a lot of people use visualization or like meditation or whatever, like, or, or do you just kind of concentrate, like, I'm just going to be the best trumpet player I can be and the rest takes care of itself or, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's a combination of those things. Um, sometimes I'll use visualizations, like, I'll remember sitting in this chair and playing what I'm about to play. Like, oh, well, that was really easy when I was in my office. So it's going to be easy right now. Um, and I'm back in my office right now, you know, or... Uh, I also like, you know, as simple as it is, just a, a very simple cleansing breath, you know, if I'm, if I'm really, you know, uh, so, you know, in through the nose, hold it slowly out through the mouth, you know, and I'll do a number of those, close my eyes and just calm myself. And that's been huge. And I, mm -hmm. I, I still use that, you know. Like I, when you're playing on stage live, are you thinking technique? Or are you thinking sound, you know, or is it both? I mean, I'm trying to think music. Mm, music you know, yeah so yeah you know so it's like at my peak the trumpet should be invisible yeah 
So yeah, you're not you worrying just... about muscles and like, you know, what to do with the muscles and all that or the fingers. It's just like you're thinking the music and the muscles do their thing. Yeah, it should just be like singing, you know, mm -hmm. at least if you're a good singer, which I'm not. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, I, but I just I want my instrument to sing the music. And, yeah. Uh, and I want it to feel like it's not even there. Yeah, that's so important. I think I hope people get that message because um, thinking music will your muscles will take care of themselves. But if you think muscles, it you become tight, you clinch up, it becomes a lot more difficult. It's like you're trying to execute a gymnastics routine or something. It's like it becomes really like a, a technical yeah. exercise. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like and think about, you know, think about where you're going with each phrase. Like, you know, um, years ago, I, I when I was in Austin, I, I was working at this uh, at this theater, you know, and they would do a lot of regional productions and stuff. And it, I loved I loved working there. And our, our stage manager, who everyone called Mama Shannon, she somebody was in her way and she just said walk with purpose mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and and so i i kind of like translated that to like play with purpose you know think about each phrase play it with a purpose don't just don't just you know walk down the middle of the hall slowly you know think about think about where you're trying to go with that and what sort of story you're trying to tell with your with your line amazing and i was just curious um so dave's Dave's dad is one of the greatest sa classical saxophone players that ever lived. An amazing player. I was just curious what it was what was it like to grow up in a highly musical household like that because I think a lot of people that aren't didn't grow up in musical households, they would wonder they wondering what it was like, you know, like did it offer certain advantages or disadvantages? Like what was it like? Yeah, I mean it was I mean it was uh I had nothing to compare it to, so it was just mm -hmm. cool, you know, it was just that was my house. Um it, it was my reality. Um, I think like, you know, it, it wouldn't be fair to not mention my mom too. Uh, you know, my mom also plays saxophone and piano mm -hmm. and, a, and accordion actually. So yeah, so like my, my mom is like amazingly talented. Um, so, so it was really like inspiring to see both of them do stuff like, like late at night when I was, you know, I don't know, seven years old or whatever, like, you know, I, I'd, I'd have bath time and my mom would play Debussy on the piano and I could hear that, um, you know, while I was playing with my rubber ducky. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, so it was like, you know, I was hearing this beautiful music on the piano. Um, and then, you know, during the day I would hear my dad practice in his office, you know, uh, I mean, I remember at one point he was practicing eight hours a day, you know. Wow. And uh, and, you know, to hear like and I'll I'll just give an example of this, you know, this is what I heard often. Um, you know, 40 beats a minute. Playing scales. Or, or, or whatever or whatever piece, you know. I would hear <laughs> the slowest 16th notes you can imagine. So he practiced really slow for a long time. Yeah, and then I would hear 41 beats per minute. <laughs> <laughs> you know. The same exercise, uh, just prepared down to surgical precision. Uh, nobody prepares like him. I uh, that's not fair to say. I'm sure there are a lot of people that do, but um, but I watched him prepare with a capital P. You know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there was no no aspect of any of his performances left up to chance, uh, and still to this day, you know, he that's how he prepares. So, how long would it take, you know, for example, if he has a concerto that he's going to perform, how long would it, would he prepare for that? Well, I mean, he'll prepare it in however much time he has. Mm -hmm. So if it's a year out, then he'll spend a year on it. You know, if well, it's in he'll three, spend a year on it. Yeah. yeah. If it's in three months, he'll spend three months on it, you know, mm -hmm. but he'll, you know, he's like a, a pit bull with his intensity of, of like, you know, zoning in on the, on the spots that need work and, you know, I mean, it was, it's really inspiring to this day. Like whenever I start to feel lazy about my own practice, I think like, well, what would he do? Like he wouldn't, he wouldn't just gloss over these two measures. He would get out the, the dang metronome and the pencil and, you know, go to town on that. So, um, so I think that was like, that was really cool. Um, I mean, as a kid, I, I thought like, <laughs> well, I don't need to do what he does. I'm, I'm young and talented. No. Not at all. Um, and his thing is, um, don't play it faster than you can play it comfortably, right? That's what he says. Yeah, or like, yeah, you know, or... don't, yeah, 
no faster than you can play it evenly. Evenly, evenly, yeah. Yeah. So um, he would really make sure it's because a lot of people will tend to jump the gun like, oh, I have it evenly. I know what I'm doing. And they'll try to get faster quickly than they should be. Right. But yeah. he he has patience. He just goes through it and accepts the process. Yeah. And the thing is, like, if you're actively listening to somebody, you can tell when they have, you know, when they have. Uh, uh, you know, when they've prepared properly, you know, uh, I remember years ago we were doing a recording project and a pianist came in and, and he said, yeah, like she's a good player, but her 16th notes rush within each other, you know? And I was like, what are you talking about? And then I listened carefully and yeah, they were, you know, da, 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 da. you know, they weren't, yeah. they weren't steady, you know? So, um, it's, it's the attention to detail. I think that separates the good from the great. Yeah. So it must've been great to see that because a lot of people are misled by this notion of like talent. They think either you're talented or you're not. And I, I'm guilty of having thought that way for a long time, you know, but I mean, growing up around your dad, RV, um, that was obviously something that he wasn't thinking about. He was just putting the work in. It wasn't about talent. It was just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there has to be a little bit of both. I mean, of course, like he's incredibly talented, mm -hmm. uh, but he's worked incredibly hard. You know? mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I mean, every so often you'll, you'll find a, a freak of nature out there who is just talented. <laughs> it doesn't have yes. to work very hard for it, but, but I think for the most of us, like we have to, you know, like, I, I feel like my talent ran out a long time ago and my hard work had to pick up the slack. It's a great way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you grew up around that your whole life and it just all, it just rubbed off on you. Yeah. I mean, it, it just, you know, that's what I wanted to do. And, and, uh, once I realized that I didn't know anything, um, you know, I, I, I got to work mm -hmm. and, uh, and here I am and I still don't know anything. So, <laughs> so I have to keep working really, really, really hard. Well, you know, a ton, you're amazing. Yeah. That was another question I had in terms of, um, so having two kids, you know, I think a lot of musicians have this notion like um, kids are going to suck up your time. It's going to um, be a detrimental effect on your career. But what is your experience around that? Did it, you know, were you more careful with your time afterwards or how did that change how you manage time? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely um, it's definitely not easier <laughs> having mm -hmm. kids, um, but it's so much fun, you know, so I would encourage anybody that wants kids, you know do it uh, yeah, yeah i mean like you know i grilled steaks with my son the other day and like that was the best <laughs> so yeah. you know i mean i have so much fun with my kids um it's it's really for it's kind of forced me to be more focused with my practice time um and i, I don't I, i'm not saying this in a i'm not trying to brag or, or anything I'm, this is just what i did is all um towards the end of the pandemic my daughter was born and and i saw there was a posting for an audition for the bakersfield symphony uh, for principal trumpet and i really wasn't sure i hadn't really taken an orchestral audition since 2003 and uh, i just wasn't sure if that sort of thing was something that i should do but i looked at the list and it wasn't a very long list and i thought like well maybe i'll try but i thought but i have a newborn at home like i can't do this and my wife said hey you, you've got to try just see what happens and uh and literally i mean she was a newborn and every night i would run through the list you know and i would work on things and i would but i didn't have a lot of hours to devote to the list i just had to be very focused and anytime something in an excerpt didn't go right or the way that i had planned i would, I would just go go straight to it and work on that um and i showed up to do the audition and i still wasn't feeling like ready or whatever but like i luckily i had a good day and i and i won the job so um and again it's not not to say that like i'm i'm amazing or, or whatever but with a newborn i was able to to win an audition so, so i just think i just think if you're if you're focused and you're meticulous with your practice it doesn't necessarily take hours and hours and hours you can probably achieve 20 percent you know, or you can get rid of that 80% of the work and, and, and really get down to the 20%, uh, the meat of it, you know, well, having a, the, yeah, I had to do. And I got and look, I got lucky. I had a good day. Um, 
but if it had, you know, if they had asked for one more excerpt, like, I don't, I think they would have dismissed me. <laughs> so, I mean, that's an amazing story. And I think, so that might have helped you in a way. I mean, having a limited amount of time forces you to be more efficient and more concentrated with your practice. And it might have just helped you prepare those excerpts better than if you had an unlimited amount of time and it was just like a free for all. Right. So, I mean, yeah. And I had yeah. less, less time to sleep. So, I mean, so probably like when you're well rested, you hear more of the negative thoughts that, you know, when you're really tired, sometimes it's like, okay, I just got to play this right now. Man, what a lesson. That's a, that's an amazing story. You know, awesome. but it's, you know, I also don't recommend preparing that way. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked. I mean, you know, I think, and I think a lot of, you know, when people win jobs, like for example, people that win those big jobs, like Philadelphia Orchestra, Chicago Symphony, those are people that normally come from other orchestras and they're working really hard and they have yeah. work and they have to manage their time as well. So it's just, yeah, I think there's a thing to that, right? Yeah. Well, Philadelphia so. just got a big upgrade. <laughs> yeah, I know. I guess. Yeah. Talk about Esteban a little bit and what you like about his sound. I'm just curious. God, he's just, he's, uh, he's incredible. Like mm -hmm. that, that tone he has, um, the fire with which he plays the intensity, uh, he plays with, with purpose, you know, um, he's just awesome. You know, I, I think and when you listen, you know, when you listen to him play, you just go like, yeah, well, if I was in that orchestra, I know exactly what I would do. Like, I know exactly how to follow him. It's, it's right there. You know, I just heard, uh, there was a recording of Chicago playing, um, the Olympic fanfare and theme, you know, with John Williams conducting. And I sent it to a buddy of mine and I said, man, like John Williams should have written it up a couple, couple more steps. Cause it wasn't hard enough for Esteban, you know? It's so that's just, a hard, that's a charred trumpet part too, huh? Yeah. But it's just yeah. like, it wasn't even high enough for him. You know, <laughs> I heard that same recording too, a few days ago. And it was awesome because he just cut through. I mean, it was oh, like, you could hear yeah. his sound. Yeah. That's yeah. just like, talk about tone imagination. Like, just imagine that you'll be cool. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's really good. Yeah. 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 He's they cut through. I'm a big fan. <laughs> yeah. 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 Awesome. Well, Dave, thanks so much. We'll let you go. But, um, um, just, uh, give a shout out to your uh, YouTube channel real quick. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, yeah. So for those of you that have interest in car stuff, uh, I have a car channel called driven Dave and that's, uh, at the driven Dave, um, on YouTube. And, uh, so I've got, I think about 500 uploads at this point. It was just a passion project. I started during the pandemic and, uh, you know, it's allowed me some really cool opportunities, um, and to interact with some other like automotive YouTubers. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's really fun because, you know, you, you can't do music all the time. <laughs> so, yeah, I know it's, it's awesome. And, uh, we did a video. It was awesome. I got the yeah. Tesla for the first time. That was amazing. So, yeah, check out Nick on my channel. Yeah, he, he did a great job uh, uh, getting used to the Tesla experience for the first time. And uh, I ended up buying a Tesla just because I, I drive so much and I really wanted that, you know, uh, the driver, the driver aids and uh, and charging at home. So I don't have to buy gas. I like it. I know. And uh, what was your website again? It was. Uh, oh, like my trumpet website. Yeah, your trumpet website. Yeah, just davidpatel.com. DavidPatel.com. You have excerpts of you playing on there and everything. Go hear Dave. Go hear him play. Yeah. 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 I have some recordings and then I also have some links to like YouTube videos of live performances and stuff. Awesome. Amazing answers. Thanks for doing this, Dave. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Nick. It's an honor to be here. And uh, I, I just love what you do with the, uh, the wise musician. Awesome. Appreciate it, man. All right. All take, right. take care. You too, Nick. Bye-bye.